All right, so I want to talk about this particular type of problem that um, my open math has you go through regarding the p-value, finding the p-value. Um, and let me see, let me see, let me see. Um, and it's really just a matter of understanding how to find the p-value from the test statistic. Now, I don't necessarily go through that process because I know the graphing calculator trick, and I just do that. But this is making sure that you go through the process of understanding that the p-value is the area corresponding to the test statistic. So let me show you what I mean. Um, okay, so let's read this. The average McDonald's restaurant generates $3.8 million in sales. This sounds like an average for a population. Population mean 3.8 million with a standard deviation of 0 0.4. So that sounds like the standard deviation is coming from the population because we're talking about a population, an average from a population with a standard deviation from a population. So that is sigma, your population standard deviation given to you, which tells us something about whether to use E or T. I'll come back to that in a second. Ken wants to know, here's the claim, here's something he wants to test. If the average sales generated by McDonald's restaurants in Massachusetts is different than the worldwide average. Automatically, I go straight to null and alternative hypothesis. Now I wanna write this out. Write this out the moment I hear the claim, the moment I hear the test, I wanna write it out. So he wants to know if the average sales, he's running a test about an average. He's running a test about mu. This is very important to know. What are you running the test about? Is it mu, is it p, which one? So being that he's running a test about um, mu or an average, I know that it's a population mean. Now, the moment that I know that I'm running a test about a population mean, I'm gonna ask myself, is sigma known or unknown? Because now I have to think of whether it's t or z that I'm gonna use. And we already determined that sigma is known. So I know that I'm gonna go and use z stuff. Z test, Z critical values, depending on what you want. So I'm doing a pop, I'm doing a claim about a mean. Sigma is known, so Z. If I were doing a claim about a mean and sigma were unknown, then it would be T. Now, um, the null carries the equal to. And being that the test or the claim or that what he wants to test, whether or not it's different, the alternative is not equal to. Is it the same or is it different than the population mean of 3.8? million. Now I'm not going to put million. I'm going to put just 3.8. This is in millions of dollars. Okay. So I already have all this information with what? Two sentences. The average McDonald's restaurant generates, this is an average from a population and a standard deviation from a population. Sigma is known. Sigma is known. Okay. Um, he wants to know if the average sales in this particular area is different. So is it the same or is it different? Um, he surveys 18 restaurants, that's my sample size, and finds the following data. This is all in millions of dollars, right? So we're not actually putting all the zeros. Perform a hypothesis testing using 4% level of significance. That's my alpha, 4% in decimal 0 0.04. So um, I want to convert all the verbiage, all the words, into my notation because it makes it easier, but I want to also understand what the notation represents for the situation. Um, you guys have a lot of drop down menus for this particular type of question in my open math. And the first one is here. You know, is it left tailed, right tailed, two tailed? Which one is it? So, being that the alternative is not equal to, it's a two tailed test. We have a two tailed test. Now, this particular question does not ask you for critical values, okay? So, I mean, I technically don't need them, but I'm going to actually find them just for practice because I get questions about it all the time. And being that it's a two-tailed test, I have two, what we call rejection regions, right? Two rejection regions. This is a region in which you can reject the null. And these rejection regions, they're also known as critical regions. They correspond to critical values. And when I have a two-tailed test, I have two critical values. It's the only time that I have two critical values. Now, being that we determined we're using z-scores because sigma is known, I'm on a standard normal distribution curve, and my critical value is a z-score, or they are z-scores. If you've seen any of my videos, 
your rejection region has an area of alpha, but because I have two rejection regions, I have to split alpha into two pieces. So this is the process I'm going through to find the critical value, which technically this question does not ask me for, but I'm going to do for practice. So my critical value is the value, and in this case, a z-score. If I were on a t distribution, it'd be a t-score, but in this case, a z-score that corresponds to the rejection region, which is alpha. I have to split alpha into two because it's a two-tailed test. Let's go to my calculator. If I want a z-score, and I know an area, if we remember this, I um, I go to second vars, I'm looking for inverse norm. So I've told you guys like intro to stats, man, you are basically living in, in vars, like distribution or stat. If you want critical values, you're going second vars. Inverse norm, if it's a z-score, inverse t, if it's a t-score. This one is a z-score, inverse norm. Area. I'm going to find the critical value over here in the left tail because it's a little bit easier. So the area to the left of this left tailed critical value is alpha over 2 and alpha is 0 0.04. So you could straight up put 0 0.04 divided by 2. OK, now. I'm not changing this. I'm not putting this information at the top here. In here, why? because I'm on a standard normal distribution curve and I want a critical value. So if you ever saw me talk about standard normal distribution curves and z-scores, the moment you talk about a standard normal distribution curve or a z-score, you are automatically going mean is zero and standard deviation is one. Okay, the critical value is kind of like, think of this as like separate from this, okay, for the second, because you're finding these critical values. So this is my left tail negative, 2.054. So 2.054. Now, technically, I have positive and negative because it's a symmetric curve. So I found the left tailed one, which is negative, but the right tailed one is positive. And there's two of them. They're the same values, opposite numbers, because it's a symmetric curve. Now, again, this question didn't ask me for the critical value, but I wanted to do it just for practice to make sure you guys know how to do that. OK, critical value corresponds to rejection region, which is alpha. All right, so let's keep going. This is the next question they asked me. Assuming the null hypothesis is true, determine the features of the distribution of the point estimates using the central limit theorem. Go back to the central limit theorem. By the central limit theorem, we know that the point estimates are. Now you have a drop down menu here. You have a choice of normal distribution or T distribution. And we already talked about that we're not using T, so normal distribution, with a distribution mean. So if you remember the central limit theorem, you remember you did it with like your basic case, you did it with sums and you did it with averages. I'm not doing averages or sum, I'm doing the basic case. So my mean is simply 3.8 in millions. And my standard deviation is, remember this, your standard error, sigma over the square root of n. So let me find that. Sigma was what, 0.4 and n is 18. So 0.4 divided by the square root of 18. 0.4 divided by the square root of 18, 0.09428. So approximately 0 0.09428. Now, you know, I'm gonna use this value for other things, but, um, or I might use this value for other things. So I techni technically, you know, like to take four, five digits to the right of the decimal because I want less error at the end of the day. But I'm going to check and make sure that they don't tell me or ask me how uh, ask me tell me how they want me to round because if I don't round how I'm asked to round then I can get a question wrong right but they don't tell me so I'm going to go ahead and do five four or five digits to the right of the decimal for that um, now this is the part that you guys get all confused I get all these questions about you got all these drop down menus find the p value you guys have this probability that, and it has X bar, it has um, P hat, it has less than or equal. You have all these drop down menus here, and this is where people get confused because this is where you're finding the P value like the old school way. So I'm going to find the P value with the graphing calculator trick, and then we'll compare it. I'll show you what they want here and compare the two. Technically, Right again, I'm going to draw another standard normal distribution curve because I'm dealing with standard normal distribution. I still have two tails because it's a two tailed test. But now the area here is the p value cut in half because it's two tailed. 
If it were not two-tailed, then the area would be all of the p-value. Now I need the test statistic to find this area. So, all right, I'm gonna um, find the test statistic using my graphing calculator method. Because I have, uh, you know, otherwise I would use a formula, but I'm not gonna use a formula. I'm use a graphing calculator method. Because if I were not asked for these particular pieces, I wouldn't even use that to find the p-value. Um, but that's the way you do it. Now, um, I have a list of numbers here, right? And so I already input them into my calculator. Remember how to do it? Stat and then edit is where you input them. I put them in L1, okay? So pause the video if you need to right now and put all of those into L1 because you should do this with me, right? Um, I already have them in there. So pause the video, put them in to your calculator so you have them in there for when you're going to do the rest of this stuff, okay? So pause right here and then come back. Um, all right, so I have them in my L1. Second quit. I remember where I put them. Now when I run a test, stat, and I'm going to scroll over to test. Now all the stuff that ends in test is going to give me a p-value or a test statistic. I'm running a test. All the stuff down here that ends in interval or int is going to give me an interval. That's why it ends in interval. That deals with a confidence interval. I don't want that right now. So I'm going to deal with one of these cases that ends in test. Anything that has prop in it deals with proportion. That's out. I'm not dealing with that. You don't have two samples or two populations. You, you never deal with that in this particular class, um, at Nightingale at least. So it's either Z-test or T-test. Now, we already said it was Z-test. Why is it Z-test? Again, I'm running a test, a claim about a, about a population mean, and sigma is known. So it's Z-test. Okay, enter. Now, you have a choice of data or stats. If I had stats, right, if they gave me stats, I would have X bar, sample mean, and all that stuff. I don't have that. I have a list of numbers. So I want data to be highlighted. Mu naught, this is what I'm running the claim about. And I think 3.8 is what I have, right? 3.8 is what I'm running the claim about. That's the claim value. See how it asks for sigma, the population standard deviation, because I'm dealing with z-test. Like, so the calculator is telling me when to use what. I use z and I go with sigma. I only have sigma when I'm dealing with z. So it asks me for sigma, which we said already was 0.4. So sigma is 0.4. My list is in L1. Let me make sure I put L1. Frequency, leave the frequency as one. You don't have to change that. And then this is my alternative. In my case, it's two-tailed right it's not less than or greater than so keep that highlighted and then calculate now i'm gonna screenshot this real quick i'll put this for the notes and let's put this here so this is the output right that i get after i do d test for this particular case so i'll stick it down here all right so same order if you watch any of my videos the same order um of stuff you get first this should match the alternative which it does not equal to. This is my test statistic. This is my p-value. Notice that the test statistic is also a z-score. My p-value is next. This is my sample mean, sample standard deviation, and then obviously the sample size should match what I have up there, 18. So I already know my p-value. <laughs> so technically I have this answer. My p-value is approximately 0 0.8137 if I'm rounding to four. That's done but they want me to find it this other method. So here we go. The test statistic is positive. Now there's two tails, right? So the test statistic could technically be in the left or the right, but because it's positive, the test statistic is over here in the right tail. Z is 0 0.2357, okay? Now, um, if this were a right tail test, the test statistic would have to be in the right tail. If this were a left tail test, the test statistic would have to be in the left tail. If it's two-tailed, it could be in either case. So being that it's positive, the test statistic is over here, what I would do is find this little area to the right of it, and that's gonna give me half of my p-value. That's what this part is that they want here. So you guys have this, this part, finding the p-value and such. Um, actually, let's find this area real quick, and then I'll come back to that. How do I find the area corresponding to a z-score? 
this going back, this going back to like normal CDF days, if you remember that. Normal CDF, second bars, normal CDF. If it were a T distribution, it would be um, T CDF, normal CDF for, uh, for a standard normal distribution curve. Bound the area, lower upper. My lower bound is the test statistic here, 0.2357. 0.2357. My upper value is a large number all the way in the right tail there, positive, whatever, big number. I'm not changing the mean and standard deviation again because it's a z-score. Anytime I have a z-score, my mean zero, my standard deviation one, leave that. So I'm finding this area to the right of this test statistic, 0 0.4068 over here, 0 0.4068. Now this is only half of my p-value. Now, let's come back to this, the, the notation corresponding to this. This goes back to like standard normal distribution, normal CDF, like those videos back there before central limit theorem. It asks for probability that. So finding area under a standard normal distribution curve or a normal distribution curve is the same as finding probability, right? Probability that. This is, um, you have a choice here. It's either X bar or P hat. You're going to choose X bar because you're dealing with means. You have a drop down menu next to that. It's either greater than or equal to or less than or equal to. I'm choosing greater than or equal to because my test statistic is in the right tail and the area I'm finding was to the right of that. Greater than or equal to. What's my sample mean? I got that here 3.8222. 3.8222. Okay blank space. This is what you input here. This is the same as finding the probability if I standardize it corresponding to a Z score. You have a drop down menu here. You get to choose either Z or T. It's going to be Z because we're using Z scores because sigma is known. If sigma were unknown, I would use T scores, right? Um, and it's greater than or equal to again because, right, it's to the right of the test statistic. And over here is what I put the test statistic, 0.2357. And that probability, then it says equal to, and this is what you put, 0 0.4068, okay? So let me write this here. So um, this is your sample mean, sample mean, that's the value you put there, and this is your test statistic, that's the value you put there. Now notice, notice that this number here does not match my p-value. If it were a one-tailed test, like if it were just left-tailed or right-tailed, this would match the p-value. But because it's two-tailed, I only found the area to the right of this test statistic. I got to double my p-value. I'm sorry, I got to double that area to get the p-value. So I have to do two times 0 0.4068 to get the actual p-value. So which if I double that, I get the same thing, 0.81366. I get the same thing that I got, 0.813 using the z test so this part here that they make you go through is simply just trying to understand that the p-value is the area corresponding to the test statistic and you find it by finding the area corresponding to the test statistic we don't typically do that because we have this calculator trick which gave it to me a long time ago so i just use that quick method okay i hope that makes sense um so again this is a specific question to like my open math um, they have this particular part which makes you go through this process of finding this area. So the notation is what makes everyone confused because they forgot all this notation from back in the day when you did it like in standard normal distribution, the probability. So I picked X bar here instead of P hat because I'm dealing with means. I picked greater than because the test statistic is in the right tail. So I'm dealing with area to the right of that, greater than. Sample mean, sample mean match equal to probability now i need the corresponding z score if i were dealing with a mean and sigma was unknown then this would be t but i'm dealing with z greater than or equal to this should always match this they should always be the same like uh, inequality symbol and then the test statistic and then equal to whatever that area is um this area will match the p-value if it's a one-tailed test you have to double it to get to the p-value for two-tailed but you can always verify it with your little Z test or T test or whatever you're doing there. So, um, and then I'll type this part up. Um, the P value 
So now you actually want to run the test. Let me run the test. And um, I'll use the p-value method because it's easy. I have the p-value right there. The p-value is, what is it? Is it greater than? Alpha is 0 0.04. P-value is 0.8. P-value is way bigger than alpha. Let me write my alpha. P-value is bigger than alpha. Right? And when the p-value is larger than alpha, then my conclusion would be to fail to reject the null, which means uh, I'm going to show this again. Uh, one second. Let me go here and go up here. So two options, right? Either I reject the null. If I reject the null, out, then I support this. And the not equal to, I support that it's different. But if I fail to reject the null, I cannot reject the null, then I cannot support this. And so I cannot support that it's different. So I fail to reject the null, and which means there is insufficient evidence or there is not sufficient evidence, however you want to, sufficient evidence to support the claim that, I'm just copy and paste this, that the average sales generated blah is different than that. As simple as that. Because the claim is already up in my problem. Use it. There is not sufficient evidence to support the claim that the average sales generated by McDonald's restaurants is different than the worldwide. Right? I'm, I'm failing to reject this, so I'm not supporting this. Cross this out. I'm not supporting that it's different. And that's that's it for this. You know, the, the last part of it is very repetitive. It's a very repetitive process. It's just the first part that gets tricky. What are the little, you know, pieces? What are the variables? What's the notation that you need? And then, you know, which calculator trick are you using? You do not ask this particular part for every question. This is like two or three questions in the homework. But it's not hard and you should know p-value is the area corresponding to the test statistic. But once you, you know, once you don't need that part, then you just run the test. Go straight to whatever, z-test, t-test, whatever it is that you're dealing with. Okay, so um, let me end that.